All right, if you notice, we're not in the book of Joshua tonight. We normally are on Wednesday night, but recent events have led me to um, change the, the normally scheduled Bible study into a different kind of a Bible study tonight. And as we get going here, I think you'll figure out really quickly what we're doing. And the, but what I want to notice, and the reason why we started out here in 2 Chronicles chapter 35 is um, a little bit about the life of King Josiah. King Josiah was a great king. He's actually one of my favorite Bible characters in all the Bible. I, I, I love Josiah. He comes on the scene. He's, he's pretty ignorant to the things of God. He begins ruling at a very young age. He's like eight years old when he takes over the kingdom as king. And um, he has a zeal and a desire to serve the Lord even before he even really knows the Lord, even before he even really knows you know, uh, all the stuff that's written in, in the Word of God. He doesn't really have the Word of God to guide him, but he's got this great desire to serve God and to rebuild the church. And then when they're rebuilding, you know, the house of the Lord, they find, hey, we found a copy of the book of the law. And he's like, great, you know, cool, let's read it, you know. And, and they read it and he's, and he's just realizes, wow, we've been doing things wrong. Our fathers have really done a lot of bad things and they've really done things that are wrong. And he goes through and just cleans house. He, he just has this zeal and gets on fire and just thus saith the Lord. He runs the sodomites out of the land. He goes and just starts getting things right. We see in this chapter, he's holding this great Passover. I mean, he's really excited about it. He gives and sacrifices and offers of his substance and, and so that everybody can participate and everybody's got some, some meat to, to, to eat on the Passover. And he inspires other people to give of their substance, other princes, other rulers, other people who have wealth to give so that everybody can participate in this. And the Bible says that there wasn't a Passover like that since the days of Samuel. And of course, the days of Samuel, he was the last judge before they started anointing kings. And Josiah is one of the last kings. There's a few other that come after him before they get carried away captive into, into uh, Babylon. So Josiah here, he was a great guy. He was, he was someone that really, I mean, just like everyone else, he made some mistakes. And we see he made a mistake here near the end of his life. He kind of, he was used to fighting these fights and fighting these battles. And there was one battle he kind of really didn't have any business getting involved with. And, and he got a warning from God, but he, he disregarded that and went and fought anyways. And it actually cost him his life. But that doesn't um, undo all of the great works that he had done for the Lord and just, just was a, a great uh, individual overall. And what we see here near the end of this chapter is that the people had a great mourning for him. They were sad. They were upset that this great ruler died. And let's look down here at verse number 23. It says, And the archer shot at King Josiah, and the king said to his servants, Have me away, for I am sore wounded. His servants therefore took him out of that chariot and put him in the second chariot that he had, and they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died and was buried in one of the sepulchers of his father's. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. Everyone's upset about this. Everyone goes into mourning. And Jeremiah lamented for Josiah. So now we see the prophet Jeremiah, a great man of God, is showing his respect unto Josiah, underscoring how righteous Josiah really was, that he's got the attention of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is, is, is mourning and lamenting the fact that this great king that was trying to bring the people back to serving the Lord and doing what's right had died. It says, And all the singing men and the singing women spake of Josiah and their lamentations to this day and made them an ordinance in Israel. And behold, they are written in the lamentations. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah and his goodness, according to that which was written in the law of the Lord and his deeds, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. When great men die, when great leaders and rulers die, it makes sense that people are going to be upset and should mourn that loss and show honor and respect. And you see Jeremiah and the people are all upset about this. Turn to Genesis chapter 50. We're going to see another example of this. It is a good thing and a right thing to mourn the loss of, of great men of God, of great people, people who did a lot of, of good things and good works and served the Lord. Genesis chapter 50, 
We see the passing of Israel and the lamentation and the, and the mourning that was kept for him. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, And Joseph fell upon his father's face and wept upon him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel. Look at this. And 40 days were fulfilled for him, for so were fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him three score and ten days. So he's embalmed, and their embalming process is, you know, it takes him 40 days to make sure, you know, everything's, he's prepared for his burial and stuff and the way they did things in Egypt. But this alone should stand out to you. Remember, these are, Israel's a Hebrew. You know, he's a, the father of Joseph. Of course, Joseph came in, he saved Egypt and, and saved a lot of people and saved ultimately saved his people alive. That's why God allowed him to be in charge there to, was to sustain God's people first and foremost. And then, of course, Egypt benefited from that as well during the years of famine. And Joseph was elevated in the kingdom of Egypt, you know, above pretty much everyone else except for Pharaoh. But they had so much respect for Joseph and then in turn so much respect for his father Israel that even the Egyptians, I mean, they're not Hebrews, they're just the Egyptians, even they have this great mourning of 70 days that they keep a mourning. I mean, think about that, that's over two months. That's a long time to be showing honor and respect unto someone, two, 70 days. I mean, just think about that. That'd be, you know, going into February. Someone were to die today of, of this stature, someone like, like Israel. And you've got the world showing that respect for 70 days. And keep that more. That's, that's, that's pretty significant. That's, uh, this underscores Israel, though. Look at verse number four. It says, And when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spake unto the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I found grace in your eyes, speak, I pray you, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Lo, I die. In my grave, which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan, there shalt thou bury me. Now, therefore, let me go up, I pray thee, and bury my father, and I will come again. And Pharaoh said, Go up and bury thy father, according as he made thee swear. And Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, and all the house of Joseph, and his brethren, and his father's house, only the little ones and their flocks and their herds they left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with them both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great company. So they have this huge procession of people. Again, even some of the Egyptians and the, you know, the, the, the leaders and the rulers are going out now to what we call the funeral, right? They're going to bury Israel because he's been embalmed. He's been prepared for his burial. They mourned him. Now they're going to actually bury him. It says in verse number 10, And they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond Jordan, and there they mourned with a great and very sore lamentation, and he made a mourning for his father seven days. So they had another week unto the mourning. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning in the floor of Atad, they said, This is a grievous mourning to the Egyptians. Wherefore, the name of it was called Abel Mizraim, which is beyond Jordan. They named this place in the land of Canaan, after this event that took place. So it's a, it's a very big deal. It's a very, very big thing that's going on here. Recognizing and honoring, showing respect and mourning the loss of Israel on this earth. Let's turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 5. No doubt, it is right to honor great men when they die and they're passing. But just because somebody dies doesn't mean they were great. And we have a tendency to, when someone dies, to just, oh, we're only going to talk good things about that person. And, you know, in general, I don't think it's a bad thing, you know, to have good manners, to show just some respect in general for people passing. There are certain things that are inappropriate or appropriate given different times. And, you know, if you just had someone that you work with or some acquaintance that you knew and they were kind of a jerk and you didn't really like them that much and they died, it wouldn't necessarily be appropriate to go around and just start bad mouthing that person after they died. Just let it let it go. Let it be. 
But there's a difference between a person like that and someone who's just really evil and wicked. And just to give you an illustration, think about this. What did the world do when Saddam Hussein was killed? Everyone rejoiced, right? I mean, this is something that people can remember. This was in the 90s. Saddam Hussein died. Every, oh man, it's a party in the streets. You can see, here's this great, how about Osama bin Laden, right? Everybody was thrilled. So there's this sense that, that people just in general have. I mean, I'm not talking about Christians. I'm just talking about people in general have this sense of rejoicing when wicked people die. They do. I mean, it's, that's, that's a fact. But what's going what's gonna to be the problem in the sermon tonight is that I think a lot of people aren't going to agree with me about the man that just died that really was a wicked man and should not be mourned and lamented for his loss. But I would say rather rejoice in the fact that there's one less wicked reprobate person on this earth. And of course I'm talking about George H.W. Bush. He just had his funeral today. And the media and the world's going to tell you, oh, we're going to honor this great president and, you know, and, and try to bestow honor upon honor upon this wicked man that was responsible for the death of thousands of people. Him personally was responsible as the one given the, the command to go and, and, and fight wars for greed. We'll get into that a little bit later. But let's look at Isaiah chapter 5 now because we've seen some good examples of, of good men of God being revered, being lamented, being mourned. And that's right. But let's look at Isaiah chapter 5, verse number 13. The Bible says, Therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. And their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory, and their multitude, and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. Then shall the lambs feed after their manner, and the waste places of the fat one shall strangers eat. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as it were with a cart rope that say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it. Woe unto him, verse number 20, that woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. People are calling things the way they're not, that they're not really are. You're saying something that's wicked and evil and wrong is actually good. And oh, let's, let's mourn for this person. He's a wicked man. Let's not call him good. The Bible says, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. And you get things all backwards and twisted up. Verse number 21, woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness and their blossom shall go up as dust because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despise the word of the Holy One of Israel. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 3. And what's funny about these puppets, these charlatans, these wicked men in, in positions of great power, they claim, in many cases, not in all, to be Christians. You'll see the video footage of them going to church or carrying a Bible with them or whatever. It's a facade. It's a joke. But people are so ignorant today, they think that just because they see someone hold a bowl, they just must be a righteous, oh, wow, they actually, they go to church, so they must be a God-fearing man. They must love the Lord. They must be just like you and me and is Christian and they want to do what's right by God's eyes. 
Just because someone claims the name of the Lord doesn't mean they really believe in him. Doesn't mean they really, just because they carry around a book doesn't mean they actually believe what the book says. Why don't you just look at their actions and look at their deeds when you consider whether or not they really believe that this book is true. 2 Kings chapter 3, look at verse number 11. The Bible says, But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. Now, of course, in this situation, Jehoshaphat is not right. Jehoshaphat's leaguing up and joining himself up with wicked rulers and wicked kings. Jehoshaphat himself was actually a godly king. He was, he was a righteous ruler. He was doing that which was right in general in the eyes of the Lord. He was trying to stand for God, but he made affinity with the house of Ahab. He joined up with him. He married his daughter or whatever and, and, and became in-laws with the house of Ahab. And then he decided, hey, you know, your, your people, like our people, doesn't matter that you're wicked as hell. We're just going to fight your battles for you. We're going to come in and we are all for you. And, and here he is now yoked up with the wicked king of Israel and also with the king of Edom. And they're going to fight. And he's saying, hey, before we go and do this, let's go get counsel from the Lord. And of course, they had all their yes men. All their, their Baal worshiping, you know, they call themselves prophets of the Lord, but they didn't actually have the word of the Lord. And they're all saying, yeah, God's with you. Go, you're going to win. You're doing great, you know. And he's like, can we uh, find someone else? Can we find a different prophet of the Lord to just, you know, <laughs> that we can hear from, hear, hear what the Lord has to say about this? And they're like, well, there's Elisha's here. They're like, yes, get him. Elisha's a great man of God. Joshua recognizes that. He's like, yeah, go get that man of God. He tells it like it is. And Elisha comes, and look at Elisha's attitude. Elisha is a great man of God, by the way. He is, he is what, probably one of the greatest men of God to have ever walked this earth. And look at his attitude towards the king, towards the, the person in charge of Israel, right? The king of Israel, nonetheless. God's people, Israel. Look how he, he talks to the king of Israel. Look at verse number 13. The Bible says, And Elisha said unto the king of Israel, What have I to do with thee? What? what? I've got no business with you. I don't even want to talk to you. What are you doing here? This is his answer to him. Get thee to the prophets of thy father and to the prophets of thy mother. Go, go, go talk to, to your, your religious people. You've got nothing to do with me. You don't want to hear from the word of the Lord. Go to your yes men that they could tell you whatever it is that you want to hear to your wicked prophets. You go just talk to them. He's just sending them away out of hand. He says, And the king of Israel said unto him, Nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And of course, you know, <laughs> the king of Israel is just down in the mouth because they were without water and stuff. They're going through some real hard times. And that's when they decided to call on the Lord and just see what God has to say. And he's saying, well, God just brought us here to kill us. Right? That's what the king of Israel is saying. Look at verse 14. Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee nor see thee. He's saying, the only reason why you're even getting a chance to speak with me right now, and look, look at his attitude here. And it's not a pompous, puffed up attitude. What he's doing is just demonstrating how extremely wicked the king of Israel was. And he's saying, I wouldn't even be having a conversation with you if it wasn't for Jehoshaphat being here with you. Because I actually have some respect for Jehoshaphat. Because at least Jehoshaphat's serving the Lord. At least he's trying to do what's right. I've got zero respect for you. Now we see Elisha speaking that way to the face. Not behind his back, to the face of the king of Israel. And you mean to tell me that if this, when this king of Israel dies, Elisha's going to go, oh, we all, we all need to have a moment of silence. We all need to show our respect for the king of Israel. Yeah, I know I told him to his face that I wouldn't even have anything to do with you. Why don't you just get out of here in one of his times of need? 
But that's all just water on the bridge now that he's gone. Let's just look at the good things about his life. Elisha wasn't like that. He was telling it like it is. And the king of Israel was wicked. And he's calling him out as such, and he might have nothing to do with them. He's going to have nothing to do with them in life, and he's not going to have anything to do with them in death either. He's not going to pretend to, to say good things about him just because the guy died. Turn to Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs 28. Verse number one, the Bible reads, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. For the transgression of a land, many are the princes thereof, but by a man of understanding and knowledge, the state thereof shall be prolonged. A poor man that oppresseth the poor is like a sweeping rain which leaveth no food. They, look at verse number four. They that forsake the law praise the wicked. You know when the wicked people get praised? It's because people who don't want to keep the law already, they're going to praise someone who's standing for not keeping the law, right? They that forsake the law praise the wicked, but such as keep the law contend with them. People actually love the law. In this case, when people actually love God's word, they're going to contend with the wicked person that doesn't care about God's word. They're going to stand up for it. They're going to fight against it. The Bible says in verse 5, evil men understand not judgment. But they that seek the Lord understand all things. Now, what I think we have today, we definitely have a lot of people who don't care about God's word and God's law. And that's evident. And there, a lot of them are ignorant. They've been brainwashed by the world. Maybe you can say they have some good intentions, but the fact of the matter still remains that these people really don't care that much about God's word. Because if they did, they wouldn't be letting the most abominable filth just be accepted and tolerated and promoted. There'd be a lot, be a lot more language against some of the worst, disgusting, vile things that can happen on this earth. There'd be a lot more uh, uh, opposition to that type of wickedness. So that's just evident. I mean, when you can, when you can just, when people can just accept and tolerate the most stomach-turning, disgusting, vile things that can just be done out in public and just be okay with that. And, oh, we don't want to offend anybody. Oh, I don't want, I'm supposed to love everybody. I'm not supposed to stand up and make any judgment because, you know, I'm not supposed to judge. They don't love God's law. They don't even know God's law, let alone love it. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. The wicked man that just died is wicked. And this is what the Bible is talking about. We're going to see here in Ephesians chapter 6. He's just one example. He's not the only one. He's one of many. But the Bible warns us about spiritual wickedness in high places in the book of Ephesians chapter number 6. Look at verse number 11. The Bible says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. High places are positions of power. There is a lot of spiritual wickedness in high places in this world, not just in this country, in the world. Global, look at how many global leaders are there. What global leader comes to the mind as, hey, that's actually a good guy? I can't think of one. I mean, you hear about Putin and, you know, the, the I forget the guy's name in Canada, that effeminate little pansy guy with Trudeau, right? Yeah, Trudeau and, and you know, we've got, we've got Trump. Oh, yeah, Trump came as he's an answer to prayer of God. Yeah, right. That greedy pompous, proud, full of himself. Love of money is the root of all evil. Yeah, that's more the judgment of God than, than an answer to prayer. I'm sorry. 
But um, there is spiritual wickedness in high places, and we need to recognize it as such. And, and George H.W. Bush and George W. Bush and Bill Clinton, I don't care if they have an R or a D after their name. They're all playing the same game. They're all part of the same clubs and the same groups. They're all buddy-buddy with each other. You've got John Kerry and you've got George Bush, both members of the Skull and Bones. They're both brothers in their fraternal order. They're both there for each other. They don't care about the R or the D or the principles or anything like that. They care about their power. They care about the, their wickedness, ultimately, is what it boils down to. And they're, gonna, they're not going to tell you you know, just come straight out and just be like, yeah, I'm real wicked, right? So what I've been hearing about the, you know, oh, he was such a nice guy. Oh, he was real funny. You know what? You know what's funny about that or interesting about that? John Wayne Gacy's neighbors said the same thing. Oh, yeah, he's real friendly. Oh, he's really good with the kids. Oh, he's real funny. He's real personable. He was a great neighbor. Yeah, except he, he sodomized and murdered young men. He was wicked. He was an animal. He was vile and refuse and disgusting. But he hid that part the best he could. And the spiritual wickedness in high places, guess what? They're trying to hide that part from you. So sure, they could come across. Oh, yeah. He, I, heard, I heard someone on the radio say today, he didn't hate anybody. Well, you already got something wrong with you then because you're just a liar. You say you've never, he's never hated anyone in his life. That's just weird. Who's never hated anybody in their entire life? I'm not saying you go around and just hate everybody, but I mean, just the person that even said that probably would say, well, yeah, I hate Saddam Hussein. I, but George H.W. Bush, he loved Saddam Hussein, right? It's a big love fest. As he's dropping bombs on the people of Iraq. The wickedness. It, the lies. See, I remember so much. And I had to go back and kind of refresh my memory and stuff because it's been a long time now since, since he was in charge of things and was the ruler of, a, of, of the United States, right, for those four years or whatever he was president. But he had that war. Do you know how many thousands of people lost their lives in that war? I mean, there are not many Americans. Right? That's when they televised it and they did their shock and awe and they had all the, you know, these bombs. They were just bombing, bombing, just unloading all these bombs on, the, on, the, on these towns. Guess what? When you see those bombs exploding, there's people living there. People that were living under oppression. Yeah. I, I'm, look, this isn't, I'm not pro Saddam Hussein. He was a wicked man, too. He was a wicked dictator. All these world leaders are. None of them are good, so it's not like because I'm against one, I'm for the other. I'm not for any wicked people. I am for the people that are being oppressed. I'd like to see them not have to face all that persecution and suffering, and I don't think they deserve to be bombed and died as a result of them just living, being born where they were born and being born in that condition. George H.W. Bush was also the one who, who kind of coined that, that term, the New World Order. If you know anything about the New World Order, that's the religion of Satan. That's a code word for, for just bringing in together a one world government. That's his New World Order. It's a global government. I mean, he was involved with the CFR, the Council of Foreign Relations. He was involved with all these various think tanks and all these groups that are in these positions of power and influence that really are the spiritual wickedness in high places. He, he was buddy-buddy with all of the, the, the puppet masters that pull the strings, that, that manipulate the people that are the public figureheads. He was a public figurehead for a while, but it doesn't mean he wasn't there before and after along with all the, the, the puppet masters pulling the strings in this country. He was a wicked man. Turn to Psalm 58. It's the last place I'll be turn. It's a shorter sermon tonight. But while I drive home this point, 
I don't care if he was 85 years old or however old he was. The Bible says that, the, the, that there's honor, and I'm not quoting this exactly, for the hoary head, you know, for the old man. If it be found in the way of righteousness. So it's not just every old man. Just because some frail old man dies doesn't make him a good person. Just because he had a family doesn't make him a good person. Just because he held a position of President of the United States doesn't make him good. Doesn't mean he's deserving of any respect. It doesn't. Holding a position doesn't make a person deserving of respect. And people argue with you about, oh, no, but it's the president. You have to respect the president. No, I don't. Not if they're a wicked person. You could, you could use the same example, you know, the, 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 what everyone would think of. Well, what about Adolf Hitler? What if he were your president? Oh, you have to respect him, though. I, I just have to show respect to this guy that wants to do genocide. No, I don't. No, when they stand for wicked things, when they do wicked things, you don't have my respect. I got spit on your respect. I got spit on your grave. That's what they did in the Bible. They, they dug up. They dug up the bones of the Baal worshipers. They dug them up and burned them. Why? To show the disrespect unto them. They're not respecting them. And Bush is not any deserving of any respect of anybody. And I, and I hear this stuff, and you've got all these so-called Christians, oh, yeah, George W. But, you, know, you know why they, they, they care so much about this? It's because politics has become their religion. Because they've substituted the Constitution of the United States and the Republican Party and, and all of their politics and Fox News for the Word of God, for the Holy Bible. Because they care more about that than what this book says. Because the more time you spend in this book and you start comparing this against George H.W. Bush, you're going to realize he's a really wicked person. He's not deserving of respect. And you also have to see through the lies of the media as well to, to uncover the truth about the man. And I thank God that we have... You know, the internet in an age where information can actually be passed and distributed among so many people without the few gatekeepers making sure they could filter what it is you actually hear. Because back in the 90s, you didn't really have that. Not in the early 90s. I mean, the internet was just kind of starting. You didn't have, everyone didn't have, and whatever they had was a dial-up and, you know, the... <laughs> not very not very many places or there wasn't a lot out there it didn't really get uh, ramped up until later in the, in the you know 90s or early 2000s but um, in any case regardless of the history of the internet I thank God for that for the, the information to come out because otherwise you just have a bunch of people just continuing and spreading and contributing to the lies I mean the reason why that that war in Iraq was so popular is because he was, a, I mean, it was all about oil. Go, yeah, it's easy to go back and look at it now, but back then, it was a lot of people got deceived because they, they propagandized it. He kept talking about, it was, it was the, the, the incubators, right? The kids, oh, they, they came in and, you know, they took these incubators that these, chill, these poor little babies were on. And the babies died. And that's what they sold, I mean, just over and over and over and over again to the American people to just say, this is a righteous fight. We need to go in and fight the battle. Because by and large, the people don't want to get involved in political wars. Yeah, there's wars going on in the Middle East. Iran and Iraq, they're fighting against each other. And guess what? The United States funded Iraq against Iran before turning around and fighting against Iraq. Because you've got globalist, power-hungry people in charge that care about making money. And there's a lot of money to be made in the, uh, <coughs> in the war machine. <coughs> <coughs> there's a lot of money to be made there. A lot of money to be made in war. And, and they say, we don't care about the people getting hurt by it because we're making a, a, pretty, a pretty penny here. We're making a profit. 
So they prop up one dictator against another and then they turn around and have wars with, it's just a continual warfare back and forth. You always have to have some enemy, some boogeyman to go and chase. Oh, because America was really threatened by Iraq. I mean, they were, they were having their own struggles just fighting Iran between the two of them. You think they're going to come across the ocean and just have the forces to, to come and, and have any real impact on the United States of America? No. But the propaganda in the media, along with the, with the spiritual wickedness in high places, are teaming up, which is the spiritual wickedness in the media and the spiritual wickedness in the, the, the political ruling class, team up to sell it to everybody else. Oh, here's why we're going in there. This is why you should accept this, and this is why you should support this. As opposed to just seeing the real reason and seeing through the lies, and that these are just wicked people going to make money. Wicked people that don't care at all about human life and only care about themselves. And if there is any other um, principles behind it, it's a satanic religion that they're into. It's a satanic Illuminati type, type of belief system. There's skull and bones and, and all the other garbage that he's into. The satanic influences. That's what they are. And these people, they get so proud and puffed up. They think that we're doing humanity this great service. And that's where they come up with the things like, the, like you'll see in the Georgia Guidestones. And, and how big the population should be because they're the masterminds and they're smarter than everyone else and they know we really ought to have a lot less people so we need to introduce eugenics and, and things that are going to keep the population down and we could start injecting people with these uh, heavy metals and, and getting um, you know population rates down, birth rates down, abortions up. They love death. Bible says, all they that hate me love death. In the book of Proverbs, it's talking about wisdom. They love darkness rather than light. They don't want their evil deeds exposed. They do everything in secret. That's why, you know, by the way, that's why secret societies are wicked. You don't need it. You know, church is not a secret. It shouldn't be. The Bible tells us to preach from the house, housetops. That we're, we need to boldly go out and preach the word of God. That's why we record our sermons and we post them up on the internet. We want people to see it. It's when you have a cult, a death cult like the, you know, like the, like the occult. They want to keep things hidden, keep knowledge hidden. They want to have their ruling class to rule over the slaves. Or when you have other cults like the Jehovah's Witnesses that don't have windows on their buildings. <laughs> they do everything behind closed doors. Or the Mormons in their temple. And they freak out when someone records what actually goes on inside of those places. And they don't want that coming out and being known what they actually do. And when they baptize people nude and whatever, like all the weird things that they do inside of their temples. I don't know if they still do that, but they definitely did that for a long time. They do all kinds of weird, bizarre, perverted things. Why? Because they're cults. And when they want it all being kept a secret, it's not good. Yeah. I mean, think about that. And that's why, you know, the government has all this, oh, we need to keep everything secret. You've got all this classified stuff from decades and 50 and 60 years ago. And they just don't want to cover it. Why? Because they're wicked. And they don't want their deeds to be made. Oh, it's national security because, you know, if someone knows about this, then... then we're just wide open for, you know, to be destroyed. If it, well, if it really is that serious, you know what, some of that stuff probably really is that serious. Because they're thinking, you know, if the whole world found out about this, we're going to be in some really bad shape. That, I mean, that's all that tells you. Why, I don't know why people don't put two and two together thinking, why would something so old have any bearing on our national security right now? Like, what in the world would, would we have to protect ourselves from? A bunch of angry people around the world that the United States has gotten involved in and, and committed all kinds of atrocities and war crimes. That's what they have to worry about. They don't want their evil deeds being made known. Because what, what else could it be? Don't want to expose our technology of 50 years ago. Or, or the, the political climate or the motivation, whatever it is. Because wicked people don't want others to know what they're doing. They want to have everything 
clouded and covered. And you know what? That's who George H.W. Bush was. He was all for the secrecy. He's all for the New World Order, the, the, the religion, the, the one world government, the Antichrist coming in. He's all for it. He's a wicked man. He deserves no respect. Let's honor and revere and respect the true men of God that stand up, that aren't going to get the public acclaim, that aren't going to get the world to just, uh, you know, to honor and recognize them. The people like Jeremiah, who was thrown in a dungeon, the people like Jesus Christ, who was crucified on a cross, that's who deserves our respect. Not wicked people. Spire Reds have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for giving us knowledge and wisdom from your word. God, I pray that you please help us to uh, take all the things that we see from the Bible and, and all the truths that we learn from your law to, uh, to apply them rightfully in, in this world, dear God. And I pray that you would please just open up our understanding of the scripture and help us to increasingly read and, and meditate on and love your law and your words and help us to, to live righteously, dear Lord. And I pray that you would please send truly great leaders to, to help lead like a Josiah, to help turn the people to serve the Lord and, and to do great exploits for the Lord, dear God. I pray that you please help us to, um, to raise up more leaders like that and, and that you would really um, work with a group of people that love you and want to serve you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.